Okay, hello everyone. Uh, nice seeing so many here. This is my first meet Rust meetup. This is my first time talking about Rust as well, so yeah, wish me luck. Um, how many people here have uh, like have used Rust, have written something in Rust? Okay, so most people have touched it. Okay, that's good. Because I'm not going to give you like an introduction to, to Rust or anything like that. Uh, uh, so don't worry. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about a specific thing that I'm kind of excited about using Rust for. Um, and that's involves uh, WebAssembly, compiling Rust web, WebAssembly. Um, so how many people here work, work, work with uh, web technologies in some sort of... Oh, so that's almost everyone, okay. <laughs> Well, I feel for you, I do too. Um, so, uh, first I'm going to talk a bit about myself. So, that's me. Uh, I come from background of C++, uh, mostly like high performance, real time numeric stuff. Uh, yeah, physics engines, games, uh, 3D scanning. But now I work here at Distant Networks, uh, writing Rust, which is awesome, because Rust is an awesome language. Like, that's one of the main pulls uh, from getting me here, actually. Um, but, yeah, so I've used C++ for a lot, for a lot of years, so I know about legacy crust and le legacy bad stuff. So that's why I'm going to talk about web today. Uh, yeah, so the web, uh, great for many things, not so great for other things. Especially each time I use, try to use a web app, it's slow, it's like you click things and after a while something happens, maybe. Uh, now it's. I'm going to go a bit into why, how it sucks, and then why it sucks, and how we can move forward. Now, not everything about the web sucks. There are good things about the web. Some things. Uh, like JavaScript, the good parts, you've seen that. Um, but in, in particular, I want to see if we can get a better way forward um, in the future for things like high-performance web apps. Like, say you want to make a modern Photoshop, and you want to make that in the web. I, I think using HTML5 is a bad idea for that, and I'm going to show you why. Um, so this actually ties in a bit about Rust history. So <laughs> people maybe know this, but Rust uh, goes back to Mozilla Research. It was an uh, employee at Mozilla who first created it. Mozilla started sponsoring it, and 2012 they started creating this like experimental browser called Servo in Rust to try to make uh, a nicer, faster um, browser with parallel execution and stuff. Uh, 2015, Rust 1.0 was released. Some of these parts that they've written for Servo has made them in, made into Firefox, trying to make Firefox a bit faster and safer, but it's still like a, a trickle at this point. We're still waiting for like the server browser to be released. Has everyone used Servo? Ah, there are a few. Nice, nice, yeah. It's fast, right? But it doesn't support everything. <laughs> some good, some bad. Okay. So, um, I read an article about Servo three years ago, and they linked to this benchmark. You can go to this address and uh, test your web browser. Now, this looks like a bad GIF, but this is actually a, a, like the frame rate you get visiting this website. So, it's just a bunch of rotating squares and circles, and on your modern browser, you get fem, 5, 10, 15 FPS if you're lucky, if you have a beefy computer. Right? Uh, and so, the Servo team, uh, they've done a lot of work on making stuff like uh, parallel layouts and stuff, and so they showed off this. Oh, 60 FPS, uh, not breaking any sweat, so a couple of milliseconds of execution time on a quad-core computer or something like that. So it's, it's pretty impressive, right? Except this is not, of course, released, and it's actually a bunch of rotating squares. So, <laughs> but this was 1999, 20 years ago, Quake 3 was released. Who here is Quake 3 fan? Yeah, nice. Good <laughs> so you remember, it, it was awesome, right? You had this butter smooth 60 FPS if you have a decent computer. I mean, you needed a Pentium 2, you needed <laughs> megabytes of ROM, like a whopping 70 megabyte disk space. Like, you needed a beefy computer. So, 20 year old game, 20 year old hardware, the web today. <laughs> <laughs> so, something is like really wrong here, right? This is crazy. Uh, so, some of the problem areas, now I should, from the get-go, say I'm not an expert on web technologies, because I kind of try to not learn things that are bad, because I'm going to push out good things out of my brain. Uh, but, like, 
do the do document object model. Uh, this is kind of the tree where everything sits in your uh, in your document on your uh, web page, and even the name, like document, it, it betrays how old this concept is. It used to be the web was documents that you view, but now they're supposed to be these dynamic apps. Uh, you have this CSS, which is a complicated <coughs> way. If you ever try to understand how CSS actually lay out things, it's pretty complicated. Like the size, how a parent thing can depend on the size of the children, but the size of the children depends on the size of the parents. You have this recursive uh, dependency, which is the hallmark of a chaotic system. So yeah, you design like a chaotic system as your layout engine, basically. And then, yeah, JavaScript. We all know it sucks. It's like no point going into that. But just to give you a, a, another <coughs> little, little uh, nail in the coffin. So does, does everyone understand this statement here? It's pretty straightforward. Anyone using any programming language ever would understand this. This is CSS. Media all and max width and min width. Like it's like who who came up with this and said like, oh this this is how we should write if statement. Yeah. This is from a real web page that, uh, that I looked at for like how do I do uh, responsive web pages that is doing different things depending on the width of your screen. Like whoever made came up with this should be fired. Uh, so, uh, just final slide about the old web. So it's it's 20 to 30 year old technology. Most of this, it was created for static sites, uh, and now it's kind of retrofitted to be for dynamic apps. So it's not it's not weird that it's slow and not doing what it's not designed to do. Basically, uh, you pile new things on it. You have backwards capability that you have to have. You have some browser renders that are kind of tried to make it incompatible, um, and yeah, there's no alternative, right? If you want to surf the web, there's only one web, there's, which is, like, goes without saying maybe, but it's really interesting, right? There's no competitive to HTML, basically, except native apps, but yeah, that's a different kind of bag of worms. Uh, but just to show the complexity, yeah, Firefox has 10 million lines of code, and what does a web page consist of? Like, a few images? bit of text, an interpreter for the JavaScript, like 10 million lines of codes, it just shows you like something is too complicated. Right? So, time for the good stuff, or rather, throw out the bad stuff. We don't need this, we don't need this. We're going to keep some, uh, some of the good parts. HTTP, been around for, <coughs> for a long, long time, does, it, does its job pretty well, has been updated even, compared to many of the other things. WebAssembly, who here has used WebAssembly? People. Okay, so for those who don't know, WebAssembly is kind of a uh, assembly language for web pages. You can compile other languages like Rust to WebAssembly, put it on your web page, and you get a fast number crunching uh, machine going there, uh, which is really awesome because you can throw out JavaScript. And uh, WebGL, uh, Web Graphics Library, this is a decent way to show triangles on your screen pretty quickly. So I'm gonna use only these three things, basically, uh, to reinvent the web. So, uh, yeah, obviously. Um, and yeah, I'm going to take inspiration from game tech. So, who here has worked in games? Is anyone here? Yeah, a few people? Good. Awesome. Then you're going to feel uh, right at home here. Um, so, Everyone who's working in a game probably knows about the game loop. This is the, your big while true loop in your main function that gathers input, look for input, updates the game state, renders the game state, repeats over and over and over again. 60 times per second or 120 if you're doing VR or 30 if you're uh, using bad hardware, I guess. Um, so can we do this on the web browser? Yeah, yeah, we can. Um, so. Basically, you run that code in WebAssembly. You output a bunch of triangles and render it with WebGL. Now, there's nice bindings for, uh, for Rust for actually doing things like calling into WebGL. So you can do almost everything of this in Rust. Uh, this part I did in JavaScript because it was easier so far. So there's some JavaScript still. But like 50 lines of code, so I, I hope you can forgive me. Um, yeah, okay, so let's go to the demo. Now, don't, you're not going to be blown away by this. This is something I did over a weekend, right? It's just going to show you like a proof of concept. 
So don't expect too much. So um, I'm just gonna compile this. Da -da -da -da. Okay, yay! Graphical user interface. So just to show you, I have a checkbox, I have this radio buttons, you have this button you can click. I, I know it's ugly, I'm not a UX designer. <laughs> Uh, but the fun thing about this, this is run in a, in a render loop. This is run 60 times per second, and if you can see my like CPU graph up here, it's not, it's not doing anything, because rendering a bunch of text 60 times per second should be no problem for any computer. Uh, that um, what modern web page can't even run there once in a decent amount of time is crazy, right? Um, just to show you a bit, you can have like several columns of text, you can delete them, da da da. And everything is dynamic, right? So if you make things bigger, everything else just shifts. It's, um, yeah, you can play around with like the, the styles here, the spacing. Again, everything dynamic. Uh, so, for the next part of this, this is, uh, I'm gonna talk about immediate mode uh, graphic user interface. Who, who here has heard about this? Immediate mode, guys. Oh, awesome, so many people. How many people are actually using it? So the game dev group. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Yeah, but it's awesome, right? Immediate mode. Yeah. Yep. I hope you say yes, because I'm going to show you why. So just to show you uh, what's not awesome. Um, let's see. Uh, you haven't got edge. That's awesome. <laughs> joke, joke. Um, so just to show you a very simple graphic user inverse, here's a slider and there's a button to double the value. And this is done in, in JavaScript just to show you kind of a baseline how you would do it in many environments. You'd create the slider, you create a button, create the label, and you retain these things. It's called retained mode GUI. Uh, and uh, so when, then you install callbacks. So when the range changes, you run this code. And you update your value, you remember to update your label. When someone clicks the button, you update your value, you remember to update your, your slider, you remember to update your output. And tying all these things together can be very error prone. If you, like when I wrote this, I had a bug, I forgot this line, and suddenly the label was not updating, right? Now there are higher level GUI libraries that you can use that kind of ties these together, but it's kind of like putting a nice finish on top of something that's actually very complicated on the underneath. And you always get these big callback functions, right? Suddenly some piece of code has been called because someone's clicked the button somewhere. And if you want to do a bit more complicated things, a bit more complicated, listen. This is a slider where a double button is removed once the slider is above the center. Okay, this is a stupid example, I know, but it's the first thing I come up with yesterday. So this is a very simple thing, right? But if you try to do this in, in, in uh, JavaScript, well, you have to you have to like create your uh, range. You have to create your label. But the the button you should only create that if the value is below 500. And if it goes above 500, you have to remove it. So you have to create and remove this. Or you some way hide it. Make sure you don't keep references to the whole thing. But this is this is crazy, right? Uh, at least me, I have had many bugs where I have like callbacks calling things and. and Java or C++ and there's things are not there anymore where you put them. So immediate mode goes shows a better way to do this. So I'm gonna go back uh, here. So again, same slider example. Slider, button for double it. And this is the whole code for this. Right? So this is a function that mutates a value. It also mutates the GUI because it needs to output this through GUI. So we add a slider and we add a button. And if the button is clicked, oh, we change the value. And then we add a label. And when this function is run, there's no slider anymore because the slider is never stored. What this call does, it uh, it, it generates the render commands for showing a slider on the screen. It generates the triangles basically needed. It checks if the mouse is there dragging something, and if so, this value gets changed. <coughs> so while this code is it's being called, the value is changed. Uh, and, and you can understand this, like, you cannot store a reference to the value here. Rust forbids it. In many other programming languages, you could actually store a reference to the value, maybe there's a callback changing later, 
And Rust, you can't even do that for good reason. It's a bad thing to do. So just to show you, wh what I want to do in the JavaScript example was only show a button if the value is above 500, right? So if value, oh, below 500, I think. 500, then uh, show the button. Or actually, value is a reference, so we should need to dereference that first. Okay, so if the value is 500, we show the button. And we compile that. Yeah, button is gone when it's below 500. This shouldn't be very impressive, but it's when you come from like standard GUIs, this is a breath, breath of fresh air. Because these are not magic callbacks being called. This is doing what you want when you want it. Uh, I started like, writing <coughs> medium mode GUIs uh, two years ago, and I, I, I'd never go back. You become so much more productive. Uh, so any questions about that? <laughs> I'm going to have a big question at the end. But... Okay, just to show you how this all tied together. So this is the, the, uh, the old HTML. It sets the name of the thing. It, it uh, loads the WebAssembly. It listens for the mouse movements and resizes the WebGL canvas. And basically that is listen for input and then calls. So, and it's, it's called uh, 60 times a second. And uh, the, the input to it is, uh, let's see, yeah, mouse position, screen size, uh, if it's a retina screen or not, basically, to do nice rendering. And the output is, you, when you paint it, you get these uh, paint commands. Oh, paint a circle here, paint a line here, paint a rectangle. Here. This is the output when you, and I did that, like, add slider and stuff. And that sends into a measure uh, that renders triangle meshes from that, and that sends into WebGL, and, and that's it. Uh, and as I said, this is like a toy weekend project, but it shows that you can get nice responsive GUIs that are easier to code, that run faster, and you can have rotating squares at 60 FPS. Finally! <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's uh, my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>
very unique or something. It's just show you that there's a, there's a way forward. So yeah, these are probably good tips to look